I'm Gabby. I'm going to talk about the Mentor Playbook. Um, I've been uh, helping run a monthly coding class in Kansas City for the past four or five years. Um, first as a mentor and then as a mentor director. And so I've had the opportunity to watch a lot of women come through. Um, it's a coding class for women. And um, I've had a, it's about 10 to 20 uh, volunteer mentors per session that I've been able to watch. A lot of them don't have any experience mentoring. Very few of them actually have um, some experience mentoring. So I've learned a lot from um, watching people who are new to mentoring help us out. Um, you know, these, these women are typically badasses. They are sometimes uh, learning a new skill. They're mentoring in something that they haven't used at work before. They have kids at home. They have a full-time job, um, whatever it is. And they're there. They're showing up. So. Um, we also get a lot of women who go through our pipeline from being an attendee to then becoming a mentor and then becoming uh, a developer, possibly getting their first developer job. Um, so yeah, it's sometimes really uh, surprising to see how much hesitation there is when it comes to mentoring. Uh, these women, you know, like I said, are badasses, but they wind up being pretty scared of being found out as not being real developers or not being real mentors. And so I kind of, um, the goal of my talk is to demystify mentoring a little bit so that hopefully you can approach it um, in a more comfortable way. So what is mentoring? Let's talk about where you can find uh, some mentoring opportunities. Mentoring opportunities can happen in one-on-one -on -one relationships, so what you might think of when you hear mentoring, the mentor-mentee relationship. Um, it can also happen in more formal educational environments, so it's going to be your, you know, the coding class I mentioned earlier, maybe a coding boot camp, um, any sort of more for formal classroom environment. Um, and then mentoring opportunities also come about in day-to-day -day opportunities, so it might be uh, turning your coworker and doing some knowledge sharing with them, or code reviews, I love like the idea of code reviews, um, having mentoring moments in it. So ultimately, mentoring is knowledge sharing in any capacity um, where you're trying to grow the other person, right? Um, what are some of the requirements of mentoring? One is time. Time is super important. You need to have some time available to be able to dedicate towards the person you're mentoring. Um, also, you need to be ready to give more than you take. Um, mentoring does have benefits to you as a mentor. But really, your mindset should be that the relationship is 100% always about the person you're mentoring. Um, and why would you mentor? You might want to mentor because it helps develop your skills. Uh, mentoring is a great space for you to be able to work on your communication, your leadership skills. Um, it also helps reinforce your own knowledge set. Uh, there's some truth to the statement that if you can't explain something to a four-year-old properly, then you might not have as good of a grasp as you think on that subject. So being able to explain things in different ways to people who are at a different level who possibly are beginners in a subject is a great way to reinforce your own knowledge set. Um, also, it helps expand your networks. Mentoring will expose you to people, whether it's through fellow mentors or through the person you're mentoring, it'll expose you to people that are outside of your normal peer group. Um, you can also mentor because you want to help build your community. It's a great way to make a positive impact by helping create a culture of supportive growth. And mentoring is a great space as well to um, uh, help out with uh, nurturing diversity and inclusion. So we all know intuitively that diversity and inclusion is a positive thing, but really it's a marker in the tangible success and financial success of a company or a community. So if you're looking around and you see that there are people who are underrepresented um, in your communities, mentoring would be a great way to bring in those different perspectives that are going to uh, have a positive impact on your community. Um, you might be wondering if you're ready to mentor, and the number one question that I get about mentoring is, um, do I need to be an expert, right? Um, and thankfully the answer is no, um, but like, don't you need to know all of the answers to all the questions that somebody who you're mentoring might ask? Uh, no, right? Um, so just to say it one more time, no, you don't need to be an expert. Um, so many of us have been in a situation where there's a uh, colleague who maybe is sort of like a, a knowledge bottle, bottleneck, right? Or a college professor who he's sitting up there and he knows all the things, but really he's not helping you learn anything. So just knowing things is not enough when it comes to mentoring. 
Um, saying I don't know, saying that you, there is something you don't know also makes you super relatable, maybe brings you down to a human level, so it makes you less intimidating so that you can more effectively mentor. Um, and keep in mind that mentoring really is a two-way relationship. It's about two people in a mutual relationship who are supporting each other through learning and growth. So let's talk about that learning process a little bit. Um, these are the stages of competence, and this, uh, one of my mentors includes this in one of her talks, and it's really kind of changed my relationship with the learning process. Um, you start out at the level of unconscious and incompetence where you don't know what you don't know. After that, you get to move on to the idea of conscious incompetence, where all of a sudden you know all these things that you have no idea about, right? And this can be a super overwhelming stage. Um, you're going to need uh, you're going to need resources and you're going to need discipline at this point in order to be able to move on to the idea of conscious competence. Conscious competence is basically the idea that you can execute on a knowledge set, but doing so takes a lot of effort. You're going to need time and you're going to need support in order to be able to maybe get to the level of unconscious competence. Um, this is when you kind of integrate the knowledge set into your own intuition and you. Um, can, it's sort of like second nature to you to be able to, to execute on that knowledge set. So we've all been through this countless times, you know, whether you were four years old and you were learning to ride a bike, or it's gonna be whatever new technology you learn tomorrow, like you're constantly, this is something you can't escape, right? Um, you're constantly gonna be going through this sort of wheel of suffering, yeah? So um, this is a great tool to help you develop empathy for yourself and for somebody that you're mentoring. Um, it's also, uh, it's also kind of gives you a little bit of a insight to the idea of like how many things have you picked up and uh, not mastered, yeah? Like countless things and probably there will be so many more. And um, uh, so yeah, so you've been through this lots of times so you uh, understand, you're intimately aware of all of the uh, frustrations that come along with it. The only thing that's going to make the difference from you being at the bottom of the pyramid or you being at the top of the pyramid is going to be perseverance, right? So basically all you have to do is not give up. Sounds easy, right? Well, no. So what might make the difference is this is when a mentor can step in and support you through the process so that you can actually... Um, uh, work on that knowledge set and build on it. So this doesn't mean that you have to um, have reached the level of unconscious uh, competence in everything you're in your field. What it does mean is that if you've been through it, maybe a half handful or a handful of full of times, you, um, again, like you know what the frustrations are. You can look at somebody and you can support them through the process and you can say, I've been through it, um, keep coming, don't give up. Um, I like to add the idea of reflective competence to this as well as sort of the fifth stage. So um, if you don't actively use a skill, you can definitely slide backwards down that pyramid. So mentoring is going to give you an opportunity to continue practicing that skill so that you don't lose it. Uh, so a quick thing on jargon, because when you become unconsciously competent in something, it becomes second nature to you, things like terminology, vocabulary, um, those become second nature to you, right? So you have to really be deliberate with your communication when it comes to somebody you're mentoring. Um, jargon is a shortcut to communication. It's not actually communication that's made to help somebody else understand something. So like if I told y'all that I have spent way too much time on the internet um, looking for the perfect notebook that's A4 dot grid with a quick bind comb and has a band closure and um, yeah, it may be stone paper so that I can use my stat, whatever, right? Maybe I'll picked up the word notebook, maybe. But other than that, if I was going to have that super exciting conversation with you about what my perfect notebook is, um, I would have to either explain that terminology to you or I would have to um, choose to use a different words so that y'all can keep up. Um, so yeah, keep in mind that jargon is only helpful when there's already a prior shared understanding that's established. Uh, what happens when you inevitably don't know something? Um, you can always hit pause. If you're not in the right emotional state or you don't have the right information to give somebody a good answer on something they've asked, absolutely take the time to utilize your resources 
and come back with a clear and valuable answer. Who should we mentor? We want to make sure that we're mentoring people who are asking for help, right? People who are actively looking for a mentor, but also make sure you're looking out for people who have potential. Um, you might find somebody who's kind of quiet, but maybe they have some good intuition when it comes to something specific. Um, or maybe it's somebody that you see is a natural born leader. Um, we, mentoring is gonna give you a great chance to have a huge impact uh, in helping them develop those skills, those innate talents. Um, also, be on the lookout for people dealing with change. So change is stress, whether good or bad. Yeah, so how great would it be if right when you needed support, somebody came up to you and offered you support? Make sure as well that you're looking for people both inside and outside of your network to mentor. Um, we talked about how different perspectives can benefit a community. Um, so be on the lookout for those people who do have a different background than you, that you can help bring in their perspective into the fold so that it can have a positive impact in your community. Um, also, bringing in people who have a different background than you or who might be of underrepresented communities in your field um, gives you the opportunity to, to identify and work to overcome your own unconscious biases. All right, so how, how should we mentor? We often treat mentoring as if it's an innate skill. It's this mystical thing, right? Teaching, learning, mentoring, these things are all just innate skills. Well, they're not. They're, they're things that you have to practice. You have to take the time. You have to make an effort to get better at them. So make sure that, first and foremost, you're mentoring by building trust. Um, what do we think are some good ways in a mentoring relationship? to build trust. If somebody wants a shout out, can answer it. Listening, sure. Um, so making yourself present and available to somebody to listen to them, yeah. Yeah, that's active listening, right? Taking charge of what you're listening to and, and paying attention to their concerns, sure. Yeah, I love that. The self-disclosing so that you can admit your own vulnerabilities um, is really helpful too. Yeah, so um, really anything that you can do in, a, in a, any relationship to build trust is going to be helpful when it comes to mentoring. Um, what about like following through on what you say you're going to do? Being reliable, yeah? Or um, how about, uh, I love the vulnerability thing because if you're able to share yourself, um, we normally don't trust people, we naturally don't trust people who we feel like have something to hide, right? So that's a great opportunity to overcome that. Um, yeah, so make sure that you're building credibility so that you can effectively mentor. Um, also prioritizing, so ask them, what are your priorities in the relationship? Uh, what are your priorities at work or whatever it is that you're helping mentor them in? Um, if they don't know what their goals are, help them figure them out and help them prioritize those goals. And also set expectations. Um, you want to set the expectation that you want them to be reliable, but also you want to set the expectation um, of how to communicate with you, right? Do you want uh, only remote communication? Do you want in-person communication? Do you want to schedule a meeting? Um, or do you want to ad hoc meetings? Um, what works? Email, Slack, you know, uh, maybe calls, but maybe not at 10 p.m. on a Sunday. Um, whatever it is that works for you, just make sure that you're clearly communicating that so that everybody can best utilize the relationship. Uh, network introductions can be huge for somebody that you're mentoring. Um, it's going to give them the opportunity to meet other people that can possibly become their mentors in the future as well, or at least help them widen their support network. So always, always, always assume infinite intelligence and zero knowledge. You want to treat the, the person that you're mentoring as if they're capable and as if given enough time and resources and support, they're going to succeed. Um, and make sure that you're adjusting your guidance to, to match their pace, right? Everybody learns at different paces, but really you want to make sure that you're treating them as capable. Uh, removing roadblocks is also something really important to do as a mentor. Fear is one roadblock. It's really scary to be uh, learning something new, 
Uh, some of us, the idea of asking for help from anybody for anything is terrifying, right? So create a safe environment where you can create a judgment-free zone for exploration so that they can try out things, they can take risks, they can fail, and they know that you, they're still gonna have support regardless of whether they succeed or not. Um, also establish learning as a value. Keep, maybe keep a growth mindset and help demystify that learning process that we talked about earlier um, so that they can be com comfortable and confident in learning. Fostering collaboration is also another good way to dispel fear. You wanna make sure that they're one part, you're one part of their problem solving team, they're another part of your problem solving team. So taking an interest in them, learning their hobbies, learning their interests, sharing your own hobbies and interests is gonna be huge here. You wanna make sure that you're validating their input. It's a two-way relationship as valuable. Imposter syndrome uh, is huge, especially for people of underrepresented communities. So when you already feel like you um, don't belong, when you're looking around and you see all these cues that tell you that you don't belong, it's really easy to become overwhelmed by something like imposter syndrome. So make sure you're celebrating their accomplishments. That's gonna help them keep a positive mindset so that they can squash down some of that negative thinking that comes along with um, imposter syndrome. Also, reflect on their progress. Um, if I was to ask you all, uh, what have you learned in the past year? How many things have you learned in the past year? I bet none of y'all would have any idea, right? But if you sat down, which I actually encourage everybody to do, sit down for 30 minutes for an hour, um, maybe go through your calendar invites, maybe go through your Slack conversations, your Git commits, whatever it is, right? And, and write down all the things that you've learned in the past year. You're gonna be really surprised at the number of things you did for the first time in this past year, right? Um, so something like a brag book is a great idea here um, so that they can actively keep track of what they're accomplishing and remind them you know, where they were a year ago, six months ago, a week ago, whatever it is, um, so that they can, uh, they can know that they're making progress. Also encouraging independence helps with imposter syndrome because again, it makes that process collaborative. Um, it brings them in um, to being a, the main part of their problem solving team. And it, uh, so let them kind of deviate and customize from your advice where it makes sense. Um, we need to think about how we formulate responses when it comes to mentoring. Uh, good responses are approachable, they're non-judgmental, they're not going to shame anybody in their learning process. Um, they're also vulnerable, so again, sharing your own mishaps, sharing your own mistakes. You know, if you accidentally are MRF, like, the wrong directory on a production server and brought it down on time, you know, not from experience or anything. Um, yeah, so share those, those mishaps, it's going to make you more human, it's going to make you more relatable. Um, also good responses are present, so make sure that you're establishing yourself as open and receptive to what they're saying. Uh, so body language is going to be huge for all three of those things. Um, body language is nonverbal communication is about 65% of our communication. Yeah, so make sure that what you're communicating with your body is actually what you mean to communicate. So are you making eye contact? Are you keeping an open stance? Or are you like reaching for the door, right? For any, so that you can just make your escape at any second. Are you distracted checking your email and multitasking? Those types of things pay attention to so that you know that what you're communicating is what you mean to communicate. Good responses are also encouraging, um, especially to the first few interactions. Um, they're going to walk the middle path. They're not going to go too shallow or too deep in their explanations. They're kind of going to hit that sweet spot where they can get enough information um, without feeling overwhelmed and still make a good decision. Um, so avoid the trap of too much specificity. Um, they're also non-directive. You're not going to tell somebody what to do. You're going to help them through the process of figuring out what the best solution is for themselves. Um, you can't assume that you know what's best for somebody you're mentoring. You can only help them figure it out for themselves because that what's best for them has to be self-determined. Let's take a look at some bad responses. Um, well, actually, 
yeah, if we all close our eyes, we can just hear that guy who's like waiting while I'm actually you, right? Um, yeah, the, the, something like that gives you a minor correction, and the point of a well actually is not to help you understand something better. Yeah. Um, something like it's easy is really counterintuitive. We think that we're being encouraging by saying, hey, it's so easy, don't worry about it, you can do it. Well, it could also imply that the person that you're mentoring doesn't, shouldn't need your help. It's so easy, right? Um, and then something like just XYZ, this is directive. Uh, you're telling them what to do in a specific situation, which might help them out in that situation, but really it doesn't give them anything transferable to take into the next situation. Um, so I've probably done all of these at some point, even specifically mentoring. Um, again, this is a skill you need to practice and you look out for these things, because sometimes it is counterintuitive. Some good responses would be something like, what have you considered already? Or what when that's planned? Um, these are examples of non-directive instruction that are going to help somebody through the process of figuring out what is the best solution, what worked, what didn't, um, what do I need to reiterate, or how do I plan to implement these. Um, something like what do you need to feel supported can be huge because sometimes we already know what the best answer is for ourselves. We just need to also know that if we fuck up, somebody's going to be there to support us and help us. Yeah. So. Um, something like that can, can have a huge impact on somebody feeling validated and, and feeling empowered to move forward. Um, when X, do Y because Z. So when this occurs, my advice would be to do these things and these are the reasons why. I love, 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 love this um, being a requirement pretty much for code reviews, right? Unless it's stylistic, unless it's opinionated. Um, if it's definitely something that needs to change, make sure that you're using this sort of non-directive questioning to help them along, um, to help understand why they should do X as opposed to A. Also, um, let's think about what makes us, helps us mentor better. Um, you want to treat them as a colleague first and a mentor second, and know what all approach to mentoring is going to make you way less effective. It's going to be intimidating. Um, Self-care is going to be huge. You get the opportunity here to lead by example and help create a healthy community and a healthy relationship. So take breaks when you need them. There's no shame in doing that. You can't really pour from an empty cup, so make sure that you're fully charged in order to be able to help somebody else. Right? Put your oxygen mask on first, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, know your limits and maintain your boundaries, and also learn over time. This is something that you can improve too, because I'm sure all of us have taken on too much at some point. We all know what that feels like. Um, don't beat yourself up over it. Just kind of like remember, you know, if you know after a full two-day conference you're going to be exhausted, maybe don't plan anything huge for that next day. Maybe take, take some downtime that next day. Also, work on your emotional intelligence. We could do an entire weekend workshop on emotional intelligence, but really, it's made up of three things. Um, empathy, your capacity for empathy, your personal competence, which is gonna be your self-awareness and your ability to self-manage, which that's where the self-care comes in, that's gonna be huge. Um, also your social competence, so your social awareness and your ability to manage relationships. Um, make sure you're actively working on those things. That's gonna give you a clue into somebody's emotional state so that you know when it's time to push them because they need to actually push or when it's time to sort of take a step back, or maybe maybe even suggest that they take a break. Um, so, what are some signs you think that maybe it's not the right moment to, you know, treat it as a teachable moment or a mentoring moment? Yeah. Self-deprecating, sure. The negative uh, talk you know, that's going to be counterproductive, right? So you don't want them. To Spiraling down, sure. Lack of eye contact. Lack of eye contact, yep. Defensive, Defensive sure. They're under time pressure. Time pressure, okay. Yeah, that adds another factor of stress, right? So maybe take that into account too. Yeah, so a lot of it is going to be the body language stuff that we mentioned earlier. Um, that's going to help give you a cue as to how they're feeling and what they can manage at that point. Um, 
you also don't have to only guess what somebody's emotional state is, you can ask. So a question like, hey, you seem frustrated, do you think a break right now would help? Or, hey, um, how are you feeling? Do you think you can take on a little bit more right now? Always know that you can ask somebody where they're at and what they're capable of taking on. Um, cultural and personal sensitivities. Um, so again, a lot of body language stuff here, right? You also need to account for maybe body language is slightly different because they're from a different culture, they're from a different country, their um, first language is in English, um, they have a different socioeconomic background, or whatever the differences are, make sure that you're acknowledging those and appreciating those um, and being mindful of those. Um, I had a female mentor who on paper, you know, we, we were actually pretty similar when it comes to um, demographics, background, culture, all that. But um, I realized that every single time I had a conversation with her, we would start on one end of the room and we would wind up on the other end of the room. So when I figured this out, I was really confused and I had just as much information as you guys do right now. So what do we think is happening? Both of us wanted to leave. Maybe. That wasn't the case. I, I was enjoying the conversation that way. Yeah, personal space. Which, like, to me, that's a huge blind spot because I'm pretty much an indiscriminate food sharer and double dipper. Yeah, so my personal space is a lot more malleable than hers. So basically, every single time I would take a step forward, she would take a step back. And then I would take a step forward and she would take a step back. And I was literally just chasing this woman around. Right? So those are the kind of blind spots. That's not part of my experience at all, but those are the kind of blind spots that you have to watch out for when you're mentoring somebody. Um, also keep in mind that that person has had entirely different experiences than you and they will continue to have different experiences than you, um, even sometimes with the same exact actions. Make sure you're working to outlive the relationship as well. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Because my clock's been running for five hours. Okay. Uh, so um, work on outliving the relationship. Um, focus on their character development rather than their competency. You want to build them up so that they can start making good decisions for themselves because your goal is for them to rely on you less and less over time. Uh, and treat them like you're forever going to be mentoring them. That'll help you have a long-term mindset so that you can give them long-term guidance and they can make decisions that are going to help them uh, even beyond your relationship with them. Um, also, let them make their own decisions. It's really hard sometimes when you want to save somebody from the pain of something maybe you've been through. Um, but sometimes you just kind of have to put your hand in the fire to know that it's hot. So make sure that your goal is not to tell them what to do, but your goal is to be there to support them regardless of what they choose to do. Because um, you want to save them from the greatest risk mistakes if possible, but ultimately not following your advice is a completely viable option. Um, and then really you always want to be working on improving your mentoring skills, so make sure that you're asking for feedback um, so that you can reiterate and improve based on that feedback. So we all benefit from greater mentoring in our communities. Um, it can help us create uh, healthy communities that can run on social capital and that can value and thrive on collective growth. Um, it helps develop the trust for candor and openness in our communities that can help us have greater connections and greater successes between each other. And um, for me personally, uh, mentoring, both being a mentor and having had mentors have been huge in terms of my personal life as well as my career life. It's helped me make, make, different, uh, make better decisions uh, in both aspects of my life. So I really want to encourage you all to see if there is a mentoring opportunity, see if there is somebody around you that um, you could possibly mentor at work or in your communities. And if you can't find a, a mentoring opportunity or you don't know of one in your area, Thanks. Thank you very much. We have uh, a couple of minutes left before we break for this. If there's any questions or follow-ups you want to ask, please feel free to raise your hand. I have a question. 
Um, how many of y'all have mentored somebody? How many of y'all have had a mentor? Okay. For anyone who hasn't um, been a part of a mentorship relationship, is there a hesitation there, or is it just something that's never been on your radar? You don't necessarily have to answer here, but I would love to hear from you afterwards. All right, cool. Questions? Yeah. Um, the QR code there at the bottom. Did I forget to mention that? Sorry. So if you go to my uh, go to that QR code, it'll take you to my website, and there's a link on there to the slides. Oh, and I, I also did forget to mention that um, the, if you want to use any of the content for the talk, it's under a Creative Commons Attribution Share like 4.0 license. Anybody else? Okay, cool. I would love to hear any of your feedback or if you want to catch me at any point, uh, let me know. Otherwise, enjoy. Enjoy the rest of Liberty JS.